Um, thank you for joining us and giving me the opportunity to share Ridgeline with you. So I'm going to talk about my project Ridgeline. Uh, so Ridgeline is a vacant lot in south of San Francisco in a neighborhood called uh, Ingleside, which is a very densely populated um, neighborhood of residential buildings. Uh, Ridgeline is 15 foot wide and it's about quarter of a mile long. And it's composed of five different parcels that is um, separated by city streets. And each of these parcels have their unique characteristics. They start as with the first parcel that is very flat with 2% slope. And it gets steeper, steeper as it goes further and it ends with parcel 5 that it, it has 50% slope and it's not accessible at this time. So for many years, um, the neighbors in this neighborhood used Ridge Lane as a convenient shortcut through their neighborhood and also to connect to the uh, transit um, hub of their neighborhood, such as BART and Muni stations. However, because of its steep condition and rocky uh, characteristic, it wasn't accessible to everyone. <sighs> and also because Ridge Lane is known as no man's land, it, it was attract attracting a lot of crime, such as loitering and dumping of garbage. And so it makes made it a um, very unpleasant experience for neighbors to go through this vacant space. <coughs> Okay, uh, so as a quick history of the site where Ridge Lane is located, it used to be famous for fields of wildflower where it attracted many uh, people during the year for, uh, to pick wildflowers. Um, so the first, there, um, there was two different housing development that they start on Ingleside where they didn't um, align properly and as they grow they end up in this 15 foot wide uh, lot that that is Ridge Lane today. So Ridge Lane is known as a paper street which means um, it's, it's only a street on a paper and in reality it doesn't exist. And <coughs> a proof of this fact is having diff two different naming on both sides of Ridge Lane and also this bend that connects the two the two, uh, these two streets together. Um, so about eight years ago, a group of neighbors saw this potential in this vacant lot and decided to change it. They uh, worked with different city um, agencies such as DPW and Parks Alliance and start the, this revitalization of Ridge Lane. And that was when they came to our school and asked our studio to work on conceptual design so they can envision the future of uh, their neighborhood, neighborhood park. Uh, and after a series of presentation, they really liked my design and decided to work on it. For, um, for a feasible design for the build out. So, so after that, we went to different uh, community meetings. We had one community meeting every month and where we went to different sites that had similar situation as Ridge Lane so that neighbor can see what's happening in different uh, neighborhoods. And also we had uh, design charrettes and community engagements to so the neighbor can share their hopes and um, their fears of what they want to see on the site and what they don't. One of the main things that really formed my design was this comment that all of them wanted to have a safe path of travel with a straight line of sight through the parcel, as, um, as well as having a design that is unique to Ridge Lane and it speaks of, and it can promote this identity of the whole neighborhood. So for me to really understand what makes Ridge Lane unique and what makes it different from different vacant lots in other parts of the city, I went back there again um, many times. 
And so when I was there, I noticed there's more butterflies that we normally notice in the city. So that made me very curious. So I went back and researched on butterfly habitats. So there is this um, butterfly, there's this behavior in butterflies and some other insects where they fly on their, uh, on the, th fly to the highest location of their habitat to find proper mate. And that is called hilltopping. And Ridge Lane, because of its um, southeast sun exposure and because it's blocked from prevailing winds, as well as its location on the top of the ridge, as its name uh, implies, it, it creates this perfect location for um, butterflies' hilltopping behavior. So um, that really reinforced my design concept. And for the design, I knew I wanted a straight line of sight, but also uh, I used this pattern that, that symbolizes, it, it's like um, it's an abstraction of vanation of butterfly wings. And this pattern is called Woronoi pattern. Uh, I, I use that as a pattern to um, celebrate this unique ecological uh, characteristic of the site. But other than its symbolic value, it also gave me the opportunity to create different pockets of space where um, neighbors can have moments of pause and or sit while also uh, clearing the, the access for everyone who wants to walk through the site. And um, so in order to create this butterfly ga garden, we also needed a good planting palette uh, where we use mix of native and adaptable non-native plants to create um, this um, seasonal and year-round beauty as well as to, pr to uh, promoting this um, butterfly habitat. And in order to learn more about butterfly habitat and how it works, I um, talked to this guy uh, who is an entomologist in Academy of Science, and he decided to come, on, come to Ridge Lane, and we went for a walk where he gives me different tips on how uh, I can uh, make this butterfly garden and um, also what are my um, constraints in this way. So one thing that I learned is that um, butterflies need two different plants in order to survive. One of them is nectar plants where butterfly feeds from them. The other one is host plant where the caterpillar feed from the leaves. And in general, butterflies are more flexible where, with their nectar plant, but, uh, but they're very picky about their host plants. And this is different for every different butterflies. They have many different, um, uh, they prefer different plants for their host plants. So what I did was I studied this um, different pattern of butterflies that we can expect to see in Ridge Lane in order to design for them. So it's actually like designing for people. When you're designing for people, you need to, ne you need to know who, are de who you are designing for. And this was the same process that I, need, I needed to know what are the, the, these butterflies and what they need in order to survive on Ridge Lane. <coughs> so the planting design that you see on Ridge Lane is both um, for, it, ha it has all um, host and nectar plants and it's more than just creating this beautiful planting design. It's also functional both for people and pollinators. So Ridge, Ridge Lane was also uh, certified in North American Butterfly as a certified butterfly garden that can, uh, it, that can be a resource for uh, butterfly population. And we use that on our, in future, on our uh, community board to let people now know how this park is effective, not just for people, but it's a very sensitive uh, environment and that also creates a sense of attachment for people to be responsible for the space that they're using. <coughs> so in spring 2016, uh, the construction of the first phase started and uh, construction observation was a big part of this process because we wanted to make sure the design is executed per um, 
uh, our that per neighborhood needs and also to answer a, any question that uh, our contractor had during uh, this process. So the first phase was they cleared the site from any uh, plants that we didn't want also, also uh, from any debris and rocks. Then they start grading the site based on the design that we provided and they made it um, uh, ready for a concrete pour. Then they framed the concrete path uh, based on the design that was provided to them. So in my first design, we wanted to use three different colors of concrete to create this different experience through the, whole, through the walking through the site. But um, it, we later find out having this three different color concrete that will add to the cost of this project. It's, 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 it's a very low budget project. We need to think of how we are spending our money. And also it will uh, take a longer time to build it. So what we did, we created the sim samples on site <coughs> to uh, find a way to create the dif this different textures uh, on different modules. So what we did was two different acid wash one of them was after they made the concrete, they put acid. In this case, they used sugar and water, which works as acid, and it's more environmentally friendly. Um, where they, they use it the, the first day after they poured the concrete. So this acid uh, exposed some of the aggregate and the concrete. The second one is the same process. However, it's on the second day. So there are still some aggregates exposed but in general, it creates more smooth path. The, la the last one was seeded concrete where uh, we used uh, pea gravel on top of concrete and it gives us a more bigger textures. So the pouring concrete, they started from one side to the other and used wire mesh for like in between the concrete. And so after they poured the concrete, uh, contractors made it smooth and made it ready for um, different finishes that we wanted. And uh, like a, about a week after, neighbors were able to have their first community meeti meeting on site on a fresh concrete. <laughs> so um, on June 2016, um, uh, it was the opening day of Ridge Lane where this diverse group of neighbors gathered on, on Ridge Lane and uh, celebrated opening of their uh, new uh, neighborhood park. And it was very interesting to see how these people who live very close to each other, they didn't know each other for a long time. And thanks to this common ground that they have now, they are starting to know each other and talk to their neighbors. Okay, so what was once known as a, a hazardous site and people were scared to walk through it turned into this vibrant open space that became a source of pride for this neighborhood. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, so the other th elements that we used on this on site was gabion benches where we used uh, recycled concrete and rocks from the site to fill this gabion um, bench. We used different bollard lights that illuminate the site during the night, but also we, it avoids any kind of glare into the surrounding uh, buildings. And one of the most rewarding moments was to see people who weren't able to access the site actually use it and enjoy, enjoy it on their daily basis. So as any pr landscape project, maintenance is a big part of uh, Ridge Lane 2. And actually having the first parcel done it be, and uh, people seeing how effective that is and how it can add to their community, they, starting to, they started to have different um, 
community cleanup days, uh, which happens every second, second Saturday of every month, where people gather on Ridge Lane and um, clean and if there's any garbage or uh, pick weeds. And they don't just go on first parcel, but also they go to the other phases to make this, um, this vacant lot that they have more um, pleasant for people to use. And it's not only about cleaning the site, it, it becomes th this uh, neighborhood ritual that people um, really enjoy seeing and talking to their neighbors. For example, even th if they can help with this project, but they also uh, just join their, jo join their uh, community to be part of this social engagement. We also had another um, butterfly workshop on Ridge Lane where we educate neighbors about their local butterflies and um, how they can, and, and we teach them how they can apply the same principles in their backyard in order to create their own butterfly garden. And on that day, people were able to use um, um, butterfly attractive plants and seeds and also they use the stickers to create their planting plan. So this uh, commitment of Ridge Lane neighbors was recognized by city where they award them this um, certificate of recognition uh, from different departments. Sorry. So after the success of the first parcel, uh, the neighbors and uh, other government agencies, they decided to move forward and work on uh, the rest of Ridge Lane. And um, we were able to gather funds from a Community Challenge Grant for two parcels. And we, will, we are hoping to get more for the following two. But in the meantime, uh, before getting ready for the design of future parcels, I also um, went back and get a post-occupancy evaluation to see how people are uh, using the site and how, the si how people are making the space their own. And I studied different, different patterns of use of how people interact uh, with each other and where are the parts that they prefer. Um, so one thing that we learned was having site elements such as benches and community um, boards can promote to um, unplanned social engagement. And we are, we are, so that's a positive thing that we want to see throughout the whole design. And so we're going to use it in future parcels. Also, we learned how each parcel has, even though it's very small, but also has its unique uh, microclimate which affects butterflies and also plants and how they grow within this small space. So the other thing that we find out about two months ago was that Ridge Lane has gopher problem. <laughs> and uh, so gophers go and find the roots of the plants that they find they are tasty and kill them. And that was something that we would, didn't want to see on future. Uh, and in a, as a part of our uh, maintenance, we provided this list of plants that are gopher resistant. And so we, will, we use those on Ridge Lane as well as we, we, will, use, we will continue using them for future parcels. So post-occupancy is very important. <laughs> um, so in order to have this um, um, coherent design and make the whole parcel parcels consistent, we use the same modular system that reacted to different topography of Ridge Lane. And um, this pattern gives us the opportunity to work with different rocky situations and to turn around the, rock, the rockier part and preserve them as uh, this valuable characteristic of the site. And um, so the, this modules were, um, choreographed in a way that to um, create this ex uh, exciting experience. And it, so it doesn't just connect from a, uh, connect a point A to B, but also 
uh, create this journey through their, uh, through their walk on Ridge Lane. And um, so in order, we, we also tried to save as much as we could the, ro the bedrocks on Ridge Lane. And so for that purpose, we use concrete and wood. So wood because, um, uh, wood steps because of their minimal um, footprint, they, they um, have, they, we didn't have to excavate the whole bedrock, but also uh, it will cost us a lot more, uh, less to belt. And uh, so the parts, so the parts that you see that there are wooden, it means there are more bedrocks, and the parts with pot, parts with concrete means they have softer soil. The planting design on Ridge Lane was also very site specific, and it reacted to this rocky condition as well as um, uh, their sun exposure. So, on on the on the parts that we had um, more it was more rocky, we used succulents and plants that are uh, more adaptable to rocky conditions and the rest of the planting was this mix of perennials and native and non-natives to uh, support this butterfly habitat as well as um, providing year-round beauty. So this is um, on top of parcel four where we had this big landing, we used uh, um, Gabby on benches as um, bollards, so th so the uh, cars would, cannot park in this spot, but also will promote more social engage engagement by letting people sit there and talk to their neighbors. So in this process, we also um, worked with. Um, landscape architect from DPW to make sure the design is uh, based on ADA and other city codes. So what uh, we already accomplished with this design is one parcel that is done, but the big thing is creating this uh, community between this um, neighborhood, which, which were, they were really distant from each other for many years. And um, that's one of the most rewarding parts to see if actually people using it and enjoying it together. And for me, it's um, as a future landscape architect, it's very exciting to see if this small piece of land can get, give so much to people and their environment. That makes me more excited to work on bigger projects and to make bigger, greater impacts on, for people and environment. Thank you so so much. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, that was great. <laughs> um, it's really interesting to hear um, the how integrated the butterfly um, habitat and sort of the, how you were able to create. Um, a design concept out of the structure of, or the geom geometries of the um, butterflies' wings and stuff. I thought that was pretty amazing. Thank you. Um, and it's also just great to see, you know, student work that actually becomes a real place. So I hope it in inspires all of you to um, keep going. <laughs> so why don't we take some questions? Um, we had at one point about 21 people online, so Yay. hopefully they're. <laughs> asking some questions. And um, does anyone in the room want to start? <laughs> OK, I have a question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I am curious uh, w at what point the Department of Public Works got involved in um, the project. Okay. You know, so you were working with the neighbors, but then at some point it was like, wow, this could happen. So when did they? Uh, when did you have to involve the city and sort of how did that go? Well, they were involved from beginning, like okay. all the presentations that we have through the school, that the, there were members from DPW and uh, Parks Alliance who were there. Mm -hmm. But um, when they decided to build it, it was when we worked together like one-to-one -one and mm -hmm. like really solved those problems of different budget problems that we have. We wanted to make it cheaper and also really addressing 
what users really want. Mm -hmm. So we worked more after that. Mm -hmm. But they were involved from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any online questions? <laughs> Hello, my name is Catherine. Um, I work here at the Landscape Architecture Department at the Academy of Art. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, to everyone online who has joined us. Um, we Nahal definitely has a following and so many people who love her work, yeah. uh, both online and in person. So we're so lucky to have you. Thank you. Um, we do have Elizabeth joining from Martinez, California. And then we have someone, um, Mr. Witt, joining from the Netherlands. So thank you all for joining. I have my own question, so I'm going to be a little selfish here. Um, <laughs> Nahal, could you share a little bit about how you found this field and sort of what brought you to landscape architecture? Well, my background was in interior design. And while I really enjoyed, uh, I really liked designing and solving problems, but I also found it limiting. And it was in my last semester where I was designing for this spa project, and I had a chance to really design like exterior spaces and I feel like I like this a lot more than just designing interior. Uh, it was, I also uh, in the same project I worked, um, I was, I learned about this uh, concept ca called biophilia where people, how people function better when they are uh, connected to nature or elements that mimic nature and that really reinforced my decision to start uh, learning more about landscape architecture. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll pass it back to Jeff. Um, I was curious when you were talking about your planting plan and the, the um, people were, um, <coughs> do, you know, putting down plants where they thought they should go. Yeah. Um, and you've had this process of engagement with the community. And I think a lot of designers, there's sort of a, um, stress plane or something between where you have part of your vision and what you want to design and express and then how you listen to the the uh, community and yeah. integrate what they want to do because you really want to do what they want to do but then you're also a designer and so I'm just curious how you negotiated that process. Well I think the most important part about community engagement is community education and how you teach them about why you're making this decision. And that's, I think that's the most important part of this process where you can really tell them the reason behind it. This, the, I think it also creates this sense of trust between landscape designers and community where they, they can see that things that you're doing that are based on uh, this scientific fact and they, it's it's very difficult to make to please everyone in this community engagement but um, one th I think one thing that I found very interesting is behind every comment there's a reason so for example we had this comment in our group that someone wanted security cameras to look at Ridge Lane and make it safer where we had to talk to them like this is not gonna work uh, it, th it won't promote to the safety, but also will make it look scarier than what it is. But, uh, have, if we create this design that is more vibrant, that that way you can have the safer environment, and you don't you won't you won't have any need to have the security cameras. So yeah, I, I think the best part of it this process is to have to educate the public about the not only about how they can make it, but also about what are these difficulties that we have as landscape architects or any other, um, you know, uh, design field. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. We do have one question from Elizabeth. And um, the question is, how did you acquire the support of the community for this project? So to kind of build on that, how was the conversation started or how did you connect in the very beginning? So how it started was that they, they were looking for this design that can really address their needs. And they came to our school and asked for our studio to design for them. And we had different meetings with the neighbors where they really they talk about what are the things that they want. And we were, we were involved with them from the beginning to, to really see who are these people that we are designing for. Awesome, thanks. <laughs> 
Uh, anybody else? And I have tons of questions, but I don't want to close <laughs> the mic. <laughs> so as um, all of the landscape architecture students know, um, being able to communicate the design that you are putting forth is um, really essential to the success of your project because they have to, the community who, for the most part, most people aren't well versed in reading drawings and necessarily understanding. And one of the reasons I think that Nahal won her award, I mean, there were a number of reasons um, that revolved around how she listened to the community and the strength of the idea and the project and getting it built. And really, that was a huge thing. But it was also the fact that it was presented in a way, the graphics, um, the renderings, the design concepts, the analysis, that is very um, accessible to people who don't necessarily have a design background. And so, um, I know that you were able to use some drone technology to do um, aerial surveys, uh, and uh, you have these kind of you know different kinds of rendering tools and graphics. And I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit to how you thought about organizing this and putting it together, and the kinds of tools that you use to do it. Yeah. Um, because I do think the clarity of communication is part of why the impact is so great. Yeah, so I have a hand. <laughs> um, so um, as you said, it's very important to be able to communicate your design intentions. Even if you have the best design in the world, you still need to communicate it to your client to um, make them want to build it. And it's, that is especially true about community projects too, because it's very difficult to, let, like, to speak this language that everyone can understand it. So what we did with this project, we use a lot of existing photos and photos from existing situations. So the design is not something that is very out of context and it, people can relate to it and make it more touchable. And we used a lot of drone photos because we didn't want to just focus on Ridge Lane. In every image, we wanted to focus on how it's, this is part of the bigger community, this is part of this greater context and it will affect this whole neighborhood. And the drone photos which Eric took uh, helped us a lot with that. And um, also these are the shots that people cannot see in their daily <laughs> basis when it surprises people to see them from, um, from different perspective. If this works, yeah, so for example, the first one that I showed doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, it really helps to, not just for site analysis, but also for different renderings. Ridge Lane is very small to really have, to show what's, uh, you know, in this dr drone photo. Uh, it's very tricky to get a good shot of Ridge Lane in the context which Eric did a great job on that. So, so this was one of the one of the parts that we used drone. It's Ridge Lane is again it's small enough to s to observe the site, but it can also use be used for bigger sites where people want to have uh, construction observation. Um, And also for the site, uh, yeah, for the for this one where we wanted to focus on Ridge Lane, but also we wanted to imply that this this is not just about Ridge Lane; it's about this greater, you know, context where Ridge Lane is located at. This is also a drone shot that was taken in two different photos. We connect them together and make made one image that is, I think it's pretty seamless <laughs> and highlighted, cut a section through it and highlighted the parts that Ridgeline is um, located. Okay, thank you. Um, and the other part, it's not part of this presentation was some animations uh, yeah. both overhead and in yeah. um, that are um, really cool. Yeah, that's, that's it also really helps you to understand the space. Yeah, that's also very 
it's something exciting that neighbor they, they can really be in that space and see the changes what, from what it used to be to what it is now and uh, we actually neighbors printed those photos and put them together and use it on uh, community boards for so the other neighbors can see this change that uh, is happening on their neighborhood mm -hmm. um, when you were working with the neighbors did you present multiple design possibilities and then they kind of honed in on this butterfly thing or or did you basically did you propose like one option or how did that work when you were in the early stages um, in, in our studio I, I had three different concepts that I presented to our instructor uh, but I worked on the one that was it was very like stronger from the other options and because we had this limited presentations to the neighbors I just focus on the one that is more pleasing and it works better. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? How are the butterflies doing? They're actually doing great. They, it's very seasonal, um, so each butterfly has its own season. Uh, but it, they are there and they're happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, when other sorry. On migratory routes, aren't they? They're sort uh, of stopping some of by. them, some of some of oh, them some are. Oh, some just yeah. live there. Yeah, but okay. <laughs> it's it's very um, they're limited to different uh, locations and th through the San, through San Francisco because they are limited if to the spot that they have their source um, nectar and uh, host plants. So they are very fragmented through the city. Yeah. There, there are the butterflies on Market Street. I don't know if you guys know about it. They're called tigers of tig the tiger swallowtails of Market, where um, they are adapted to um, sycamore trees on Market Street. They use that as a host a host plant, and so it's basically this canyon for their these butterflies to travel through. And it's one big subject for whoever wants to design. They need to consider this tigers of mar market yeah yeah so I guess the city is yeah it, will <laughs> yeah they have we'll they actually that. had different um, butterfly walks where people they invited people to be part of this uh, educational sessions and teach them about like the, the, the about different spots that they can see this tiger swallowtails I was part of that too it's very interesting <laughs> Okay, the last question I have <laughs> is, um, has to do with how you worked with the budget. So you, you kind of got your design together. You were obviously thinking early on that this is not a you know, multi-billion dollar museum or something. This yeah. is a community group. There's gonna be limited resources and I believe you said they had a matching grant. Yeah. So how, how did you go about actually um, integrating the design that you had with the budget and the amount of money you had to execute it? Like how, yeah. how did that work? So I, I actually, the first design that I had, I created this very uh, interesting bench with uh, precast concrete that I wanted to make it like the same system as the uh, path that we have. But we couldn't build that because it, we have limited budget. So on different phases of design, that's what we worked on to, to think about how we can reduce the, the cost. And so we actually worked on the, the, the future parcels, the proposal, we worked on it twice. The first one was expensive. It was very expensive to build. So we designed it again with wooden steps to make it less expensive uh, by cutting the budget from uh, excavating the bedrocks. So it was this process that we, we went back to what we had and think about how we can reduce. But there were also some elements that we wanted to invest on it, such as our um, bollard lights. We wanted something to, that is effective and we didn't want to go back and buy a new, uh, for example, lighting system that you know works better. So we invested on those to get a best product that we can. And because it's something that is repeated in all, all the parcels, we want it to be consistent and functional. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth from Martinez wanted to say thank you for answering her question, and then she just commented 
that it's she's learning a lot um, about how important it is to know that quote customer will be in the neighborhood every day. Yeah, so thank, you. thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, I guess we will close. Um, I want to thank everybody who's online and who's here uh, to, that came and Nahal. Thank you for coming. It was thank such you. a pleasure to hear your uh, presentation. And uh, next Thursday, we will have Marcel Wilson from uh, Bionic, uh, who's a partner at Bionic, come and talk. So I hope you guys will join us uh, for that lecture. So thank you, Nahal. Thank you. Thank you.